themselves out if they want. All right. Okay. So welcome those who are, who are showing up that are new here. Um, we're waiting for our, our the guy who's going to lead us, uh, Mark uh, McCormick, who is the our, our who has never presented here, but, but he, he 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 approached me and wanted really to be to be uh, to uh, deal with this topic. So uh, hopefully he comes up and he shows up. Otherwise, we're going to have to deal with with uh, we're going to have to you know. Deal with Hegel, Hegel on our own. I don't know. We we'll have to make up Hegel as we go, which is fine. We can probably do that. <laughs> so I'll just I'll pull out my Jezik and we'll just read Jezik well, interpretation. I, 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 could, uh, I could do a subway Hegel, I guess. <laughs> the uh, dialectic of being on a subway, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> with Hegel, he's got his main ontology. He has the logic included with with everything else so i mean he basically what i have liked about it is that yeah he starts with simple simple like being in nothing takes quality quantity measure um yeah cuts over from the determinateness to uh the mind essentiality to uh conditions and um appearance existence actuality it's it's a it's a it's a progression then he has, then he heads into subjective logic, so it's kind of a progression from uh, determinate logic from um, being a nothing right through to uh, several progressions: the inner and the outer logic, subjective. And finally, he gets to the what he calls the absolute mind, absolute idea. But the absolute idea incorporates uh, everything else, so it's not just a standalone. Uh, there's really nothing at all standalone about Hegel's system. It's all it's all one integrated totality. At least that was his intention, <laughs> right? I think that's where the a lot of the controversy comes in. Is that yeah? It, well, what I like about it is that it fits in well with my view of holistic AI because uh, okay, uh, to, really yeah. people people like to start with a pieces, and and they're, they're, mm -hmm. AI is great at pieces. Here's mm -hmm. your vision piece. Here's your logic piece. Here's your planning piece. But the integration is the hard part. And, and his, mm -hmm. his system was the first one I've seen that really takes it on in a holistic way. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm, uh, I'm yeah. just trying to get my presentation set up here. Okay, yeah. And what I can what hear just you. happened. Okay, perfect. Um, what just occurred to me here is that um, I was going to use Zoom on the same computer that has my sort of presentation on it. Yeah. But uh, because the presentation is using my video capture device, um, it won't let me video myself. So I wonder, will, will it still allow me to uh, share the screen? And then you can just hear my voice. Well, I can hear your voice, but I don't actually see you on the screen are you under um duo or or your name or mark or yes under duo yeah i'm under duo okay okay um, now yeah it... now i see your screen i think i do okay perfect uh ordinary ordinary worlds but special world yes exactly so i guess we can't really get my video up uh, but at least it'll let me share the screen okay so uh, you don't really need to see my face anyway, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I guess the important thing is Hegel. Um, so I will, I'm just uh, making it nice and uh, clean. So I guess I'll just do it from here. Okay. Um, uh, is it being recorded? Before you okay. get started, Mark, um, uh, what, tell me when you are ready. And I, I was going to make a few announcements before I hand it over to you. Is that okay? Uh, for sure. Are you recording this one? Yes. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I'm going to be providing a better recording uh, later, but as long as uh, you don't mind this presentation, sure, go ahead. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Um, if you're ready, if you're getting almost ready, I, I'm going to make a few announcements before I then I'll let you take over, if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, just a few announcements about upcoming meetups. Uh, Mike has the next one. Um, which he's here if he wants to say something about it, or if not, you can read the description. It's going to be on AI and 
Are you there, Mike? Uh, right. It's a uh, Hugo Latipe who uh, has been developing um, AGI, actual AGI applications in, in production. But his his main influence is the philosopher. Uh, whose name starts with K and I can't pronounce, but um, it, yeah. it should be really interesting. Uh, Korsvitsky. Korsvitsky. Coming up on the 18th. Okay. All right. Uh, and then I'll just announce briefly my uh, next topic, which will be toward the end of uh, September. And then I'll hand it over to, to, uh, to Mark and Hagel. Yeah, my topic is going to be a bit complex because it's well, I'm going to try to bring a tent to uh, relate a number of seemingly dis disparate ideas uh, in a hopeful, in a way in which they, they, they make sense. One is the traditional problem of evil, you know, in, in relation to like belief in God, the tradition in relation to the traditional notion of God as an all powerful, all knowing, all good being. Uh, the other idea is the nature and purpose of heaven, which comes up in, Judah, in the Abrahamic religions. Uh, secular future visions such as transhumanism, which share some of the same problems, which I'm going to bring up. Darwin, versions of the non-identity problems, such as what, uh, such as how much change can things stand before we say they are no longer significantly related to what they were before the change. And more importantly, how far may our empathetic imaginations span this change, especially when what changes is us, not objects. And this will involve discussing empirical findings about recent empirical findings about human nature. For example, uh, are we hedonist? Uh, many people, many philosophers especially have, have thought we basically are. However, there's uh, at least some, some uh, empiricists, namely Paul Bloom at Yale, who thinks that no, we're not. And this, in, that we're at, had in fact, this involves discussing empirical findings about human nature. You said, are we hedonist or is masochism in, in the mix of our evolutionary inheritance? And if so, what exactly does heaven or any ideas faintly resembling heaven, including secular <laughs> ones, have to do with us? Or I call this the problem of bliss. Anyway, I'll, this is complex, but I'll try to explain it at my meetup. And you can also read a lot about it in advance in the, the write up to my short description. And uh, well, that's enough for now as far as intro. I want to let, hand it over now to, uh, to Mark. And hey, okay, Mark, to yours. Fantastic. Uh, welcome, fellow philosophers. Uh, I appreciate being here with you in our element. Uh, thanks to Victor for inviting me to the group to present uh, what I think is, is uh, the new course in philosophy. And it's the course that I think has been missing for about 200 years since one of the greatest philosophers of all time uh, passed away all too soon uh, before he really got to spread his philosophy. And of course, that philosopher is Georg Hegel. Uh, he was uh, born um, before the French Revolution uh, and he died in about 1831 when he was about 61 years of age. Uh, but in that time, he did something remarkable that I don't believe any philosopher before him or any philosopher after him has accomplished or even understood. And I'm quite excited to present it to you uh, because it took me about 3,000 hours to grasp it myself. And I'm hoping that this presentation will do uh, a decent job inspiring you to at least pursue the direction for yourself and give uh, Hegel a second chance or a third chance or a tenth chance, <laughs> depending on how many decades you've been in the philosophical game. Um, because I really think there's something that can change the world here. And that's exactly what he was trying to do um, before he passed away. So I want to start somewhere a little bit unconventional. Uh, I want to bring you on a journey because pursuing this direction is not going to happen. You're not going to realize it probably overnight. Any good philosopher realizes you have to tarry with the concepts yourself. And Hegel himself says that. But I put on the screen here 
uh, a classic example of what's called the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, who studied a lot of myth in the past. And of course, Hegel is considered uh, a little bit of a mytholo mythological character because he stood out as this anomaly that didn't seem to make much sense. Uh, he seemed to be this blend, this confusing blend between religion, uh, myth, sensuousness, story, parable, Christianity, all these types of things, but also seem to be scientific or claiming to at least be being scientific to the point that some uh, great philosophical minds like Feuerbach and others uh, who came after him thought that he was a pure atheist and pretending to be this uh, religious character. But I think Hegel was doing both at the same time. And in order to understand it, our hero's journey has to begin at the beginning. And so when you start a hero's journey, you start, of course, with the status quo. And that's the current interpretation of Hegel and philosophy today. You then get a call to action, and then it kind of goes around and you return to yourself. And Hegel is very famous for this because his system is supposed to be a circle that is about departure and return. Um, the big thing to take away from here from these 13 or 17 stages of the journey is really this ordinary world and this special world. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor actually. Is it showing my cursor? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is where for me, it became a whole different ball game, a whole different interpretation came up across my mind at about the 1500 to 2000 hour mark of reading Hegel directly. So I had spent a couple of hours reading Hegel through other uh, sources, you know, Marx, uh, Feuerbach, uh, Holgate, a bunch of contemporary philosophers. Uh, but when I decided to read him directly, it took about 1500 hours to realize that these two worlds exist. So the ordinary world is the world where I think most people are interpreting Hegel today. And some religious folks are, are half grasping this world, but in an indeterminate, unscientific way, which is why all the scientific stuff Hegel does uh, doesn't make sense to them. Um, or sorry, in the ordinary world, um, we interpret Hegel as just scientific, but really there is this special world that religion is trying to grasp. And this, of course, is what heaven was supposed to be, uh, the paranormal, all this kind of stuff that's not really scientific. What I discovered is that there's a strange blend between what we'd consider ordinary science, acceptable modern science, where you know we kind of have Kant uh, subjectivity or subject of idealism, the categories are all in our, our minds. There is no other world. And I think that the most profound thing that'll probably come out of this talk is probably the realization that some version of these two worlds exists. And that's exactly how Hegel meant to be understood, not in one or the other, but both simultaneously in what he called a new mystical way of thinking. And this mysticism, he said, is what speculative thinking, true philosophical thinking was all about, was holding these contradictions in concrete unities, unities where you could have difference inside of them and still make sense in a logical order. So a more concrete version of this graph is the actual one that Joseph Campbell used and it has a lot more detail in it. This time we're going counterclockwise. But I'm gonna try and line up how we should begin the journey with Hegel because it took probably a thousand hours to just figure that out for myself because I think the greatest obstacle in terms of getting into the true Hegel is just knowing where to start. And for me, I had spent hundreds of hours reading in the wrong places. And uh, of course, there's tons of disagreement because Hegel was dealing in contradictions where if you were one-sided or pigeonholing him in any way, you could find, you can find your truth in him and you can begin there. But is it the true beginning? Well, that's why there's so much disagreement. I think there's a call to action that we all get as philosophers. And usually it's a call for a greater wisdom to address some kind of problem that 
is imminent to our personal life or to the world that we care about. So right now, some of the biggest problems are freedom, inequality, climate change, and just plain anxiety, uh, particularly after the pandemic. So when you get this call to action, usually you want to start where, at the highest sources of wisdom. And anybody who's been a student of philosophy usually discovers Hegel uh, at some point as sort of the final boss or some kind of weird anomaly that only PhD students study because when you start reading him, the second call, uh, the second part of the hero's journey uh, occurs, which is refusal of the call. So what happens is most people say Hegel's first masterpiece was the phenomenology of spirit, as you can see here on the screen. And they try and read that directly. But of course, just because it was Hegel's first masterwork doesn't mean it's the true beginning. Hegel says it is an introduction into his entire system, but it's more of a primer, I found. A primer in that, in terms of marketing, he says you can't get somebody into a new world unless you meet them where they are and you're using terms that are familiar to them. Even if they don't clearly and philosophically understand those terms or words or concepts, he says you have to begin with that. And so that's exactly why he starts with phenomenology, because there's nothing we know better as ordinary thinkers than our own sense perception, perception itself, and what we think we understand. All the familiar objects of space, time, objects, um, law, all these ordinary familiar categories, he's using to prime us to be curious that what we thought was obvious, we don't understand at all. So when somebody dives in first uh, uh, into this primer and think it's the true beginning, they get a rude awakening and they refuse the call to rise to this level of wisdom. Usually there's many ways this, this refusal can happen in terms of, ah, it's a waste of time. It's meaningless verbiage. He doesn't make any sense at all. Um, this is kind of what uh, Bertrand Russell and others uh, in analytic philosophy accuse Hegel of. Um, others just say he's too, even if he makes sense, it's too hard. Uh, whatever the excuse is, it's such a mental strain that you might initially be motivated to seek the highest wisdom, but very quickly you realize how much work it is. You have to carry with it directly. And Hegel doesn't soften it up very much, at least in, the, in his phenomenology of spirit. So once the call is refused to pursue a higher wisdom, um, we have to experience an, a moment of inspiration to return to that call. So I actually put two copies of Hegel's uh, phenomenology here. One is at the beginning of the circle and one is at the end, once you come back full circle. And that's because technically Hegel begins at a beginning, but it's actually where you end up at the end with absolute cognition. That's why it's so hard to start with it because he's giving it to you all at once. Uh, so you do have this return occurring and it burns you out, but to get inspired to reach the end, I think that we need some kind of supernatural aid. And that supernatural aid hasn't existed in I would say 200 years. And we now have a group of Hegelians building at this, at this Facebook group called Hegelians Who Want to Change the World. It's a group that I started to start discussing uh, this new interpretation that I discovered after the first 3,000 hours. And I still have a, a long ways to go, but I think we can resolve all these different interpretations over the last 200 years into one systematic interpretation. But the key to it is we have to grasp what speculative thinking really is. And so I think for the first time, um, myself and a few others can break through this refusal of the call in whatever form it comes. And we can cross the threshold into the true Hegel. So when you cross the threshold in the, the hero's journey, this is where you're leaving the ordinary world and you're actually taking seriously a potential faith or an, a belief in a different interpretation, a different possible world uh, than what is traditionally understood by Hegel's philosophy. So this is where we commit and we say, okay, I'm inspired to take up the call again and I know it's going to be painful. And so there's these memes about Hegel where, you know, anybody who reads them experiences a tremendous pain and headaches galore. 
So you can see migraines, hypertension, stress. This is where we make the, de the declaration that we're going to pursue Hegel seriously and cross over into reading him directly. When we read in him, read in him read, start to read him directly, what I found is that the true beginning, you can't see very clearly here, but I put it in red. The true beginning, the true introduction to the system is actually his history of philosophy. And I only discovered this when he started referencing a lot of the last 3000 years of philosophers. He says in his introduction to the history of philosophy that the history of philosophy itself can serve as an introduction to the true beginning of the system, which is not the phenomenology. He says, if you read the history of philosophy, you're going to uncover how he constructed his linchpin, the core of his system, because he took it from literally every single philosopher before him that he th thought genuinely contributed to the advancement of philosophy. Philosophy has been growing through human history, not in some random way, but as a progress that most Hegelian scholars know is the progress of what he calls spirit. But what is progressing is not just some indeterminate spirit or some kind of force that we can't really know. We can only talk about it in terms of omnipotence, you know, all these religious terms. Hegel says, no, that was the mistake of religion. So this is a progression that you are, not only can you understand, you're supposed to understand. And to get a glimpse of it, uh, where he got it from, you can look at the 115 plus philosophers he put in his history of philosophy. There's about 115 in there. He, he not only interprets them, but he distills their principles and connects them to one another. And he does this in a profound way, which rebuilds his science of logic. Where the, the science of logic is the next step that once you seriously commit and you realize what the history of philosophy is doing, that he's literally, he's literally going through 3,000 3, years of the world's greatest minds, and he's purifying it into the next step, which is the belly of the whale. The belly of the whale is the true beginning of Hegel's system. So his system is the science of logic, and he starts with pure being. To help people get through it, because it is the most difficult part of his system, we're creating these new sessions called the scintillating science of logic, where we're going to go line by line through every paragraph, starting at the beginning, and explaining with this new interpretation how to read it speculatively straight from the beginning. And it will greatly help people see past the abstractions that the last 200 years have projected onto the true beginning. And of course, the true beginning, once you do the introduction, is with pure being. And he does a pretty profound job explaining that uh, in his introduction in the, in the science of logic. So once you're in the belly of the whale and you start realizing that there's a lot of truth to what he's saying in this profoundly contradictory way, we start teaching it um, speculatively so that philosophers can, can go into the world and start making sense of why complete opposites make sense. So the biggest division that happens with serious Hegelians who actually read the science of logic and realize that it is the, tr the true beginning even though they might've missed the introduction as the history of philosophy, is that they immediately do what Hegel said not to do, which is don't split into contradictory one-sidednesses. So we had the left Hegelians and the right Hegelians spark up as soon as he died. And the left Hegelians or the right Hegelians are the ones that believe Hegel was religious and conservative and Christian because he declared himself to be Christian. And then of course you have the left Hegelians who said, no, he's atheistic and uh, he's just saying that he's religious so he doesn't get killed, you know, in the terror after the French Revolution and all these other political things. Um, but we're going to bring them back together to make sense that they're both right and they're both wrong. Once we teach the speculative way of thinking, we want it to become practical. And we have this wisdom quiz where we check now to see if the philosophers who are taking this new interpretation are falling into that trap. And it's teaching them the central principle to the science of logic. The science of logic is actually a masterclass in what Hegel calls sublation. And of course, sublation uh, is kind of like the thesis, the antithesis, uh, and, the, and the synthesis. But it's actually the living essence of the movement of wisdom itself. So that doesn't make a lot of sense right now to a lot of people. But it is the single greatest missing piece of logic in his science of logic. Without sublation, 
you can't understand any of the movements properly. Negation is usually what it, uh, is usually focused on with Hegelian scholars because Hegel is understood as the negative philosopher. But that's only because the first moment of the system is the first negation. But there's a second negation, as we know, the negation of negation, which is sublation. But it actually takes over in spirit in the latter half of his entire system. And it is greatly underestimated and greatly underemphasized by everybody, including Marx. So the wisdom quiz checks to see if you not only theoretically understand sublation, which a lot of scholars do, but practically understand it as well and utilize it in your dialectics, in your actual philosophizing in current society. That's important because Hegel says you have to go through this road of trials where you actually have to practice this in your own mind to bring it out of your thing or bring it into your thinking so it can affect your being in the world. And so this is where we're sort of, you know, allowing people to make the mistakes and check over and over and over again that there is a right interpretation to Hegel and that this sort of mystical interpretation where it's like, no, you can read Hegel any way you want will finally be done away with because you can't read Hegel any way you want. You have to read him speculatively if, you're, if he's going to make sense all the way through. So we really wanna make this sublation absolutely clearly understood um, by helping people work through the dialectic, that negative moment to reason with actual focus on a reapplication of sublation over and over. Now this stuff doesn't pertain to you guys so much, but once people understand sublation, that's where blessedness begins for Hegel. If you don't know how to sublate clearly, you're never going to overcome the first negation and you're going to keep repeating what he calls the slaughter bench of history. You're never going to get to a full satisfaction or what he calls a universal satisfaction. That's why Hegel's philosophy hasn't changed the world yet is because nobody's understood it enough to get past that first negation and start sublating in the real world and satisfy all the areas of human life that we need to have satisfied to think uh, deeply and uh, emerge from the particularities of life that distract us from our inner world. And so we help people um, take on this philosophical project by satisfying all these things that take away from it. And there's about 11 things you have to do to get people taking ser uh, philosophy seriously as a major part of their life and not just learning wisdom, but embodying it in the world. The final, so there's temptation. Once people's lives get in order, there's temptation because you get intimacy and all the stuff that was lacking in your life that made you have a call to action suddenly feels a lot more satisfied because you're getting a lot of help from genuine philosophers. Um, but the real ordeal, Hegel says, is to actually usher in world spirit. So a lot of people are trying to do a version of this uh, in an abstract way. And this is where we're getting a lot of conspiracy theory um, and what's called the Illuminati and a lot of stuff that doesn't seem very academic. But Hegel does touch on this in a certain way, just not conspiratorially. He touches on it um, academically and historically that really what he, he says is the whole point of all this journey so far is that the final ordeal, the atonement with the father, is that you're supposed to change the whole world by ushering in these universals to sublate the current order with a new world spirit. So what's happening today and what has always happened in history is that new powers come to be and they establish a new order through violence. But if you understand sublation truly as a genuine philosopher, you don't fall into that trap. You actually create a new world spirit in the spirit of sublation. And that's what we need to start doing because our technologies and our interconnectedness is becoming so incredible globally that we can't really afford to have the wars we had in the past. We can't afford to have a hot war because we have nukes and we'll kill ourselves. So we need to have a much higher wisdom. And Hegel says that is the actual point of, the, of philosophy. It just doesn't necessarily have to be the Illuminati. It just means we have to upgrade our, our societies. The reason why people are treating it as a conspiracy is because education levels are so low because people are technically not free enough to think deeply. And they're falling prey to um, a lot of uh, sensuousness and you know, advertising and, and all this type of stuff that capitalism and even socialism are, are distracting people with daily. So this is the journey. The rest of it is sort of a return to understanding this absolute consciousness that you learn once society and your inner world start aligning in this higher sublative philosophy and true speculative thinking. But I won't go over that because we have to progress that far. I just wanted to show that this is sort of the point. This is the journey 
I discovered you're supposed to go on as a genuine philosopher. Now, this is a lot to take in. Um, so to make it a little bit more concrete, we're going to provide some tools to people. And to make it a little bit more fun, especially for the youthful generations, there is a, um, a new way to teach it that I'm trying to, to build. And it's kind of like a game. If you gamify things, it intrigues people on a new level. And uh, what I want to show here is that the hero's journey uh, can be tracked. Um, that's okay. I guess I can't really figure it out right now. But to help people grasp how practical this is, uh, current philosophy needs to be understood clearly. So I have these golden nuggets on the side. And these don't look like golden nuggets, but they're actually Minecraft golden nuggets. So they're taken from our current epoch so that, they, so that this is the familiarity that Hegel says we have to use to reach people in our current contemporary culture, especially the young. A lot of people are retreating after the pandemic into games um, and video games, but the youth need to understand what real philosophy is so we can start rebuilding the education system around what Hegel calls real philosophy. So he makes a distinction. And each one of these golden nuggets is a distinction uh, that is currently missing in what we call philosophy today. And these golden nuggets allow you to debate with any contemporary philosopher and sublate them very quickly. So even though this looks very uh, adversarial, sublate your enemies. The trick here is that sublate implies that you love your enemies and you recognize their truth just like Hegel did in his history of philosophy. He wasn't trying to refute philosophers in an abstract way where he canceled them completely and then replaced them with his system. Sublation is more about integration and absorption. So we're gonna end this adversarial way of debating, which has been holding philosophy back for hundreds of years and return philosophy to its true spirit, its true living essence, which is that when you're debating with somebody, it's supposed to be more like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, where it's more like a game. And so one of the first golden nuggets that we teach in this new interpretation is what I said already in terms of the journey, that what we have today is not real philosophy for Hegel. It's abstract philosophy and this painful, fragmented way. Genuine philosophy is about thinking in totalities, where you're refuting with sublation, not abstract negation. And I give a presentation where at the 15 minute mark um, in the scintillating science of logic, I explain that a little bit more. But most people don't realize that there is a difference in philosophy. Most people don't, without this difference, they don't realize that philosophy itself needs to change as a whole. What has happened, and I'll get into this in a few minutes, actually, philosophy is powerless and it's kind of relegated to a hobby rather than its true place, which is to change the whole world and introduce a new world spirit. And the reason why it's relegated to the back of academia as a sort of useless pastime that has no practical significance, except in niche scenarios, is because it's not embodying its true notion, which is the genuine philosophy of Hegel. And I think Hegel is right. I think there is something wrong with the current way philosophy is happening, and we all can sense it. Um, so when you're debating with somebody, don't get trapped in this first mode of philosophy. That's the first thing we teach the new genuine philosophers, is to know the, the difference. That's how you begin. The second gold nugget is that the true introduction is not the phenomenology. So don't waste your time unless you want to be inspired to know how little you think you know. This is the Socratic moment where you learn that you don't know anything about the familiar terms you use every day. It's just a primer like we talked about earlier. The third nugget is that the true introduction is not even the science of logic, it's the history of philosophy. And the fourth nugget is that once you grasp the, the true beginning of the system, which is the science of logic, um, you realize that he's just applying it to the two other spheres of his encyclopedia, the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit. So Hegel's encyclopedia is this whole system, and it's not a normal encyclopedia. Through the contemporary interpretations of Hegelian scholarship, they say that the encyclopedia was something he did for high school students while he was teaching at a high school before he became famous. But the truth is that the encyclopedia is the topmost level of the macro logical movements of his entire system that we're supposed to put everything else into. 
we're supposed to fulfill it. And it's incredible because it still makes sense. But in order to understand all the micro moves, you do need the filling in. But it stands on its own as this sort of divine text. So what makes it different from an ordinary encyclopedia is that we're not just arranging the pieces of information, which is what Wikipedia and current encyclopedias are. We're just arranging things that look like they have commonalities and putting them side by side. There's no logical order to it. But Hegel says in his encyclopedia, you're ordering all the concepts with one logic. It is the universal logic that is missing in terms of abstract philosophy, but it is the linchpin of genuine philosophy. So we're empowering new scholars, especially the young, to not fall into this trap that the encyclopedia is not something to be followed. It's actually the most incredible thing a human being probably has ever done. And it's literally supposed to be this new encyclopedia that we're going to restructure all of the education system under. So it's, it has a new practical application. And Hegel tried to do that when he moved away from the high school and started moving up the academic ladder to eventually ascend to the topmost position in all of uh, philosophy in Germany, um, to the University of Berlin. But it, when he died, it stopped. And we need to continue that. The other thing is... Um, Really, the encyclopedia is just the science of logic applied over and over again in all three domains. And so that's why learning the science of logic is where you should start, um, because you can't really understand the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit without it. I'll get into that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. The fifth nugget, oh, and for the religious, um, the encyclopedia is actually the living Bible. It's the essence of God, uh, but in a scientific way. But if you're secular or atheist, it's really the science of sciences. It's the same thing. It's a living Bible, though, and that's why the current Bible is sort of dead, because it's not in its true spiritual order. The fifth nugget is that the difficult thing with Hegel is not understanding the individual stages. The dialectical stages, as spirit progresses, once you grasp them, they seem incredibly simple. There's a universality, though, that is hard to teach. And the universality is kind of what we're, we're showing in the encyclopedia. So what I'm trying to teach now uh, with this new scintillating logic series is that we're going to teach the history of philosophy, the science of logic, and the lesser logic, the encyclopedia logic, all three of those texts all at the same time, because they're technically doing uh, the same thing all at the same time in different ways. And the thing that we're hoping to tease out is the universality. That is the hard thing to teach, this fractal reoccurring. But after 3,000 hours, I grasped it, that that is actually happening. And that's what we need to understand. The sixth nugget is that um, the simplicity is what distracts us from taking Hegel seriously. We have to teach the universality with the simplicity to grasp the true complexity. Because if you don't have the simplicity, the complexity overwhelms and it burns us out and we refuse the call. Um, so I think by teaching the universality uh, at the same time as the simplicity, we can get to this complexity that won't overwhelm people and this paradoxical experience that as you learn Hegel, the incredible difficulty actually becomes profoundly simple, becomes manageable. And that's the one thing that kept burning me out in the 3000 hours is that you would get to these stages where it doesn't seem like you're learning anything new. It's just repeating something you think you already know. Uh, so that's a hurdle we want uh, the new philosophers not to fall into because it makes you give up. The seventh nugget is that genuine philosophy is not supposed to be theoretical only. It's supposed to be practical in spirit. So ab that's why abstract philosophy is sort of relegated into this powerless position because the stereotype of it is that it is theoretical and all of our greatest scholars are too afraid to get into the political arena and apply their philosophies because you might lose your grant funding. You might lose all your power in society because as an academic, you're supposed to stay unbiased and you're not supposed to partake in anything practical uh, because then you might be seen as, as unreliable, uncredible. But Hegel says, no, the reality is you're supposed to apply your theory to practice and practice is supposed to inform your theory back and forth. And of course we know Marx was the one that sort of picked up on that, but he didn't finish it completely. Um, so we wanna empower people to go out and live this kind of philosophy so we can break free of the abstract stereotypes where nobody wants to engage with it. And that's by grasping number eight, this sublation once, once again. And you can see that this is not just a gold nugget, it's a gold bar, because this is central. And once you learn all of these golden nuggets, 
this is the one that's really hard to grasp in its universality because it seems so simple, but it's literally what Jesus and Buddha and all these great teachers and divine uh, figures of history were trying to tell us when they said life, life, life. It was really just understanding the simplicity of this movement everywhere, including in our own minds. Now, this gets into this other kind of world, but by gamifying it, we're hoping to continue giving these golden nuggets to the entire science of logic and the encyclopedia to start breaking out of the, the hold that abstract philosophy has on Hegel and is killing the spirit in him. And that's why we're not changing the world and bringing philosophy back to its rightful place where it actually is supposed to belong. So uh, what I would like to do, oh, there it is, it's up there. This is, this is the actual, <laughs> this is the actual journey, but okay. So what I wanna do is um, show you a diagram that makes sense of this. And maybe I should have used it at the beginning, but we are going to read Hegel's Science of Logic paragraph by paragraph to show irrefutably that the interpretation we're teaching makes the most sense. Um, and here's the diagram that we're building as we go along. So this is not how we're gonna give it to uh, non-philosophers and to the young because it's overwhelming. But I think the only people who are gonna to come to this chat are probably people who have read a lot of philosophy already. Um, so I hope you're not too overwhelmed, but this is just a chart of what I just explained in terms of getting a hold on the true Hegel and breaking out of the abstract understanding. And with 20 minutes left, uh, I'm hoping to fulfill what is in the description of this presentation in the meetup group, which is that Hegel is worth studying, even in regards to all the other philosophers of history, um, because he did something special with them and made them more relevant, not less relevant in terms of the history of philosophy. So I think in the description, I was gonna compare Hegel to Parmenides, Her Heraclitus, uh, Socrates, um, Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Leibniz, Fichte, Kant, Fichte, Frege, Russell, uh, Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein. So can we, can we cover all these immense thinkers in, 20, in 19 minutes? Well, with this graphic, I think we can. And I'm hoping that it'll make a lot more sense than how abstract philosophy is interpreting to th them today, which is burning out not only our senior philosophers, but even new, uh, the young that are coming into philosophy for the first time are starting to experience a tremendous amount of anxiety because the philosophies and the access to the philosophies is so immense that it's almost unmanageable. Like even just reading one philosopher is overwhelming in itself. So we have to do something about this growing anxiety and depression that's occurring, especially in academia, if, if current statistics are true. Um, and I think one of the reasons for it is that there's this, this rote memorization that we have to do where none of these philosophers are really connected in one living totality that we can memorize in a heuristical way. We have to memorize them each one by one as separate and fragmented and abstract where they're negating each other if they're talking about the same subjects at all. And it causes an immense load on memory that if you don't have a, an incredibly high IQ is almost impossible for you to learn. So Hegel solves this problem and this graph I'm hoping will help solve it too. Okay, so I don't know if it's easy for you to read the writing, but that's not really the point. As long as you can read this top uh, section, this is the encyclopedia from Hegel. So golden nugget number one, if we go back to the player menu, is that there's a difference between genuine philosophy and abstract philosophy. Genuine philosophy is the entire encyclopedia connected in one order, moving in one direction with one logic. So the second nugget is that the phenomenology of spirit is not the true beginning. When I read Hegel, I finally discovered where the heck we're supposed to put the phenomenology of spirit. And it's actually in the last third of the entire encyclopedia, in the first moment, which is subjective spirit, in the second moment of subjective spirit. So the first moment is anthropology, but this is where the phenomenology occurs. And this is why in his famous preface, he says a lot has gone on behind the back of consciousness because he's talking about all of this, all of this stuff comes before the phenomenology of spirit. And you can't really grasp the logic of the phenomenology of spirit 
unless you do all these first. That's why it's so difficult to start here. So that's why we're not going to anymore. The third nugget is that the true beginning is, of course, the history of philosophy, which you can barely read here, but it starts before the science of logic. So the science of logic starts where this black arrow ends and the red arrow begins. So this whole red arrow is the science of logic. And on the top of the arrow is the lesser logic. So this is the shorthand high school version of the science of logic condensed in a very short space with the highest levels of the categories um, here, here. So this is the science of logic. Here is the lesser logic. Oh no, so this, this is the doctrine of being. This is the doctrine of essence. And this is the doctrine of the notion. These are the three biggest sections of the science of logic. But really, they reoccur in the greater logic. So underneath the red line is the greater logic. And it shows you the full immensity of each section. So it starts here. The second section starts here. And the third section starts here. The lesser logic and the greater logic are doing the exact same thing. But you can see uh, the difference. And you'll know why I'm kind of showing them both at the same time. But they don't pass into the phenomenology of spirit and the philosophy of spirit directly. There's a transformation that kind of happens when you start entering the philosophy of, of nature. Um, so the fourth nugget sort of talks about this, that it was that the encyclopedia is one universal logic. That universal logic is this. It is the lesser logic and the greater logic reapplied to the next two categories in their special forms. And I'm taking this golden nugget and I'm making it continuous because there are no breaks in this encyclopedia. There is no gaps. Literally every single concept is linked to the one prior to it. There's no gaps in here. And when we get to Frega, hopefully in the next 13 minutes, I can cover that. Uh, that's the fourth nugget. The fifth nugget is that the hard thing to show is the universality that this black arrow, that this red arrow, that this blue arrow, and that this yellow arrow are all doing the same thing. They're all just repeating this tremendous amount of categorical thinking in the realm of pure thought, except in sensuous form, and then in a mix of sensuous and super sensuous form and what we call spirit, which is our mind. But, but there's a difficulty in showing that because it looks like they're saying different things because he's using different words. But underneath the words is the same logic. And Wittgenstein and his language games start to hit upon this, but he didn't grasp the purity of the logic. There is no sensuousness in this realm of logic. There is no color, taste, nothing. This is in the realm of pure thought itself, which is what Kant was uh, verging onto with a priori thinking. But the sixth nugget is that even though he's using different words, uh, even in the science of logic, it's talking about something so simple that when you grasp it, you get this paradoxical feeling that all of this craziness here that's happening can be summarized in incredibly profoundly simple ways compared to the way we're currently thinking about it in terms of all these philosophers. Um, and there's one, uh, there's another two nuggets, as you know, but before I do that, to make it look simple, let's start po positioning these philosophers that are tremendously difficult to understand in themselves. So the first one is Parmenides. Hegel says that once you get past, well, the history of philosophy starts with Parmenides. So real philosophy, not genuine philosophy yet, but just philosophy as a concept breaks away from, uh, from religious consciousness, which occurs before the philosophy, uh, before the history of philosophy starts. So the Oriental philosophy, the Vedas, all that kind of stuff has philosoph philosophical concepts in it, but because they couldn't break it out of sensuousness, which means the realm of nature, they weren't considered pure philosophy. That's why they look philosophical, but in terms of real philosophy, you have to start with pure thought. So the first person to grasp the first pure thought in the form of pure thought was Parmenides. And that first pure thought was pure being. And that's where in the history of philosophy, Parmenides comes in the beginning, but in terms of the science of logic, it starts uh, right here in the first circle. This is the first pure thought and in contingent human history, it starts with Parmenides. So let's put Parmenides where he belongs, which is right here. 
Um, actually, let's put them right in the beginning. So that's his central principle. The Eleatics, the school that Parmenides belonged to, said the rest of the categories were untrue. Nothingness, becoming, all these other categories were not the truth. The true God, the true pure thought, was the unchangingness of pure being. And Hegel says that's true. It's the first universal. Um, then we sort of get uh, Zeno, which I didn't put in our little list here. But I made a presentation uh, on academia.edu that has another graph um, where I do discuss these three in more detail. But we start actually, Thales technically comes before um, Xenophanes and Parmenides with the first universal, but he only grasps it centrally as water. Then you get sort of Xenophanes and Parmenides saying, okay, you got pure being, and then you have uh, Zeno come next, which is where Hegel says we have the dialectic formal, the negative moment to start up, where you get pure being opposite uh, from pure nothing. And then he says, no, they're both technically happening and they're both true. Um, but it wasn't until Heraclitus comes along that he unites this contradiction in a concrete totality. And that's why Hegel says the first concrete thought is the one where we realize that pure being and pure nothing belong to each other and they turn into each other. And when you grasp that they belong to each other and they're turning into each other, that's the unity of what pure becoming is supposed to be. Not sensuous becoming. All of this stuff is happening in the realm of pure thought. This stuff is happening in the realm of contingency and sensuousness. Um, so let's place uh, Heraclitus back in his position in the map. Oops, almost too much going on here. So Heraclitus comes after Parmenides still in the history of philosophy. And he's the, he's the synthesis, the inner synthesis of Parmenides and Zeno. So a little bit further on, after we cover the, the pre-Socratics, Hegel covers Socrates. So Socrates' central principle is this concept of an oracle. And we like to think that, Par, uh, that Socrates was very high up on the food chain of philosophy because we say he's technically the father of philosophy. But Hegel still regards him as an early philosopher, still one worth studying because he didn't really understand what he was doing. So his Socratic method, Hegel says, is correct. It is proper dialectic, but it's only subjective dialectic. And it's not in the systematic way, like this golden nugget number four. He didn't show the dialectical sublations over and over and over and over again and how they connect to each other. This is what system is. Uh, we know that Socrates didn't do that. Not only, so some scholars will catch that, but not only did Socrates not grasp the systematic nature of dialectic, he also didn't grasp the Socratic method as self-consciousness, meaning that he was doing it subconsciously, that his intuition was able to do it, and he was trying to explain it. But because it wasn't fully self-conscious, Hegel calls it an oracle that he relied on inside of himself. So at the time of, of ancient Greece, the way that people made decisions is that they were external oracles where they took entrails of snakes and stuff like that and they would throw it into the wind and wherever it landed that would be the divine essence of you know what they were supposed to do or make a decision on that was wisdom to them so he says that all that socrates did is he took that external oracle and he recognized that it was in, in himself but he was relying on his intuition a lot and he wasn't really reasoning it in an explicit way that hegel would call genuine reason later on down the road so Socrates still belongs in early philosophy, but he comes after Parmenides and Heraclitus because he, he knows that all categories have this dialectical nature to them, not just pure being or pure becoming, but he's, his subconscious, his oracle is able to do this to literally every single concept in his society at the time, which is why he got killed because they thought he was introducing a new God, which was this sort of inner God that was challenging the Athenian um, power structure. And of course, he's edified in history because he died for his belief in the dialectic. Um, but then his most famous pupil, uh, Plato, came afterwards. And he, according to Hegel, um, started to fill in what, of course, Socrates was missing, which was the system. So Plato comes next, and he doesn't make the same mistake as Socrates. He's very clever in his dialogues, and he never states his own position. 
He's just doing the subjective dialectic using other agents to show the limits of every category. But he starts putting it, Hegel says, into a systematic order. But he doesn't complete it. He doesn't put it into an encyclopedia. He just starts putting it in a systematic order. So that's why we're just going to put him at the start. He doesn't create a science of logic. What he does is he, he basically edges on the beginning of the science of logic, but he doesn't realize that pure being is inside of it. So what he does is he opens this realm of pure thought, this red arrow from here to here. According to Hegel, Plato was the first one to open this realm uh, in a more concrete way than uh, Ana Anaxagoras, who said everything was nous. He said there's this realm of forms. So yes, Hegel's science of logic really is the realm of forms. And he's only beginning it though, because he only leaves it in terms of an indeterminate he says the perfect forms belong here, but you can never know them because you're trapped in this realm, in the imperfect forms, in the sensuous realm. So he never defines this. It's all blank to him. So he, he just opens it up. So we're going to leave him there. In terms of Aristotle, most people think Aristotle is an abstract negation of Plato, right? Plato is this idealist, realm of forms, and Aristotle was this empiricist. That's not true. Aristotle is the sublation of Plato, meaning that Aristotle also knew that this realm of forms existed, but he did something that Plato couldn't grasp, which is that he bridged the sensuous world of nature with the pure world in terms of universals. So we're going to put play Aristotle between the red arrow and the blue arrow, which is where the science of logic ends and the philosophy of spirit, uh, philosophy of nature begins. In terms of Descartes, we have a huge leap. Um, because technically philosophy becomes stoic and it becomes skepticism. Then Rome did a bunch of stuff with Jesus. And then we had the Neoplatonists, which all made kind of granular improvements on Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, but it wasn't these huge revolutions. And then scholasticism happened, which completely missed the mark and delayed philosophy for a thousand years, he said. So even though he claims to be religious, he's very harsh on religion because they made God into an indeterminate blank, just like Plato made the realm of forms an indeterminate blank. And he says, this is the Lord that begins wisdom, but you can't know it. You're just afraid of this realm because you can never know it. But of course, Hegel says we can know it. And that's what the science of logic is profoundly. So Descartes comes along after all this mess of scholasticism and all this. And genuine philosophy enters its own native soil for the first time. And he says that pure thought starts thinking about pure thought. No sensuousness. It's kind of what Parmenides was doing with pure thought. But hey, uh, Descartes realized that you can do it with the pure eye itself. And this is where his famous, I think, therefore I am comes in. But he says, this is the true foundation of knowledge. That's not true. Descartes, according to Hegel, didn't perform the abstract, uh, the absolute negation of his own self enough. He negated all of his senses. He negated all of this stuff in a way, but he didn't negate self-consciousness itself. So really... Descartes makes an assumption that the self is needed to do the thinking of these pure thoughts at all. So instead of, I think, therefore I am, Hegel says, get rid of the I. He says, you don't need it. Pure thought thinks itself, which means that instead of, I think, therefore I am, you have rather thinking, therefore is. The true beginning that Descartes couldn't grasp is this true pure being concept in its right order, in the realm of forms. So... We're going to leave Descartes where the phenomenology of spirit is because technically that's where the phenomenology of spirit starts. It starts with, I think, therefore I am. That's why it has consciousness perceiving the universals of time and space. Time and space happens over here with Aristotle in terms of sensuousness. He just didn't put it all in the right order. So Descartes couldn't break out of that assumption of the pure I. The pure I has to construct itself in the science of logic first in an objective way. Leibniz. Um, comes after and he realizes that there's something to this pure thought dialectical stuff that Descartes is doing, not necessarily dialectical um, perfectly, but there's a systematic way he's doing it. And Leibniz tried to make it into the first universal logic, what he called his characteristicus uh, universalis. So he was the first one that tried to make uh, this golden nugget number four more complete, but he fell short. Because he said, because Hegel says, even though he tried to grasp the concreteness, the universality of it, actually golden nugget number five, technically, um, he didn't do it concretely. He externally 
permutated all these combinations of the syllogism, which is how these parts are connected. All of these parts of pure thought in the science of logic are actually connected by the syllogism from Aristotle, uh, except that Leibniz was doing it in a dead external way, um, which is why he couldn't grasp the true beginning. So he was on the right track, but he did it in this dead lifeless way that was missing sublation, which is what the true living syllogism that, hit, that Aristotle was applying um, is what he missed. To be honest, guys, if I can go over a couple of minutes, uh, Aristotle, Hegel says Aristotle, out of all these guys, was still considered the greatest speculative philosopher because even though he didn't grasp the true system and he didn't fill out everything perfectly, his way of analysis was truly speculative. So the way he was applying the syllogism as the universal form of reason was the true way to do it. Uh, and he only really taught uh, Alexander the Great the true way to do it, which is why Alexander rose to power so fantastically and uh, also brutally. So you're not supposed to be that brutal, right? But uh, Aristotle started pulling away from Alexander because he was making mistakes in terms of the, the logic. Okay, so um, he missed the living syllogism, but Leibniz started grasping the universality uh, along with other people in history but they didn't do it in this concrete way, which was the sublation of Descartes and all these previous philosophers in the medium of pure thought. Uh, so then we get Kant and Kant comes along and says, I want to create a revolution where this pure reason, this pure thought realm doesn't really exist. All that exists is the subjective idealism in our head. Our categories of thinking aren't objective in themselves. They're just in our brains. So he falls squarely in this philosophy of spirit realm. He doesn't grasp any of this stuff over here. Uh, how Hegel overcomes Kant is that in order for us to know the thing in itself, the categories already have to be implicitly in it. And so we're just realizing that the categories in ourselves and the categories in the world are the same. And that sublates subjectivity and objectivity into what Hegel calls absolute idealism. So the kind of idealism that people think Hegel traditionally has is not real idealism. It's not Hegel's real idealism. It's Kant's idealism. Um, which is in opposition to realism, which we, you're going to see is uh, the analytic philosophers in a second. But he says, Fichte makes the same mistake, except he calls it the pure eye and the impulse from without. So if you know anything about Fichte, you have sort of, um, you have sort of the pure eye. If this is the pure eye, then you have an impulse from without influencing it to do something it starts up the eyes thinking so it's outside of the eye so this is technically the same thing as Kant's thing in itself it doesn't belong in the eye so then the problem with this is you have to justify where this thing came from how do you justify with this you can't just assume it's there if it's true science every proposition has to be justified and Kant makes the same mistake he just gives it different words but he's getting a little bit closer that the pure eye is the linchpin to making all this make sense. Um, but then we get a break. We get Hegel comes along and he puts all of these guys into an order. And that order is the science, uh, the, the science of logic, which is Plato's realms filled out. Uh, but then he connects it to nature and then uh, spirit into, into the encyclopedia. He shows the universality and he shows the simplicity of it over and over again using the living syllogism. But then we get the analytic philosophers who sort of ignore all of it and try and restart again. Frege knew there was a universality. So he also started to do what Leibniz was trying to do, but he wanted to ignore all this other baloney about uh, this weird version of totality and contradiction. And he wanted to just make a logic that had no contradictions in it, but was still universal. Um, so he's kind of rebuilding the encyclopedia, but he never achieved it obviously because he didn't achieve how to think speculatively. So we ended up getting into contradictions, um, which is where Bertrand Russell came in. Bertrand Russell came in and also tried to understand Hegel, but of course, pigeonholed him into easy abstractions and couldn't grasp speculative thought. But what he did grasp was one speculative moment in Frege's philosophy, which was that there was a paradox in his notation, his conceptual notation, which he called concept script, the Griff script. And it was that uh, the set of all sets, the universal of all universals has to have itself in itself. 
And of course, this is a famous paradox that you can look up online and it completely, it made Frege distraught. So Frege abandoned some of his system and had to reformulate it. And of course, they came up with this other theory to try and approximate it. But what they were trying to approximate is what Hegel had already done in terms of his universality. They just didn't understand the speculative nature of it like Aristotle probably would have if he was alive today. So they couldn't actually grasp the true universal logic in analytic notation because of this. And Wittgenstein comes along and almost grasps it. The power of his mind was so immense that he reached the analytical limit and he started grasping the speculative contradictory nature of the logic but he couldn't break out of sensuousness to grasp the pure logic, the a priori in itself of language. His language always approximated the, lo the logic in sensuous form. To Hegel, language is the workhorse of this logic. So Wittgenstein was seeing the logic in its speculative contradictory form in language, but he couldn't, put, he couldn't get out of the abstraction and into the metaphysics because of his time, his reputation, a bunch of stuff. He just abandoned the whole thing and said it was useless at the end. He said, language games, you can't justify them objectively. We make them up, all this kind of stuff. Um, but he was verging on what he feared the most, which was that there was this other world that was objective in terms of justifying itself. Um, this world is objective. It's thinking itself. It is not to be mistaken as us thinking it. When you negate the pure I, the I think, therefore I am, you're not there anymore. You're witnessing something that has always already happened. You're beginning eternity. And Hegel finds an incredibly clever way to do that by being more Descartes than Descartes, more Kant than Kant, more Leibniz than Leibniz, more Fichte than Fichte. And then what we're discovering today is that when we read or when I read Frege and all these analytic philosophers, they are repeating what Hegel has already accomplished. Um, so they're worth studying. But I think where we're going to bridge analytic philosophy and con continental philosophy is in putting the science of logic, Plato's realm of forms, determine it into modern analytic logical notation to show the universality and the simplicity in a way that's familiar to our greatest minds in terms of modern science. So I hope I did uh, a good job summarizing some of the most profound and enigmatic thinkers in philosophy. And the reason why I'm able to do this now is because Hegel is profoundly clear and he explains all of that, all of them except the analytic philosophers in his history of philosophy already. So if you're interested, you can go check it for yourself. He does this with 115. I just gave the top 12 that most people would recognize because they're more popular. But uh, I hope you are recognizing some of the power of this because the seventh golden nugget is you that we really aren't supposed to be in our ivory towers anymore if we're going to follow Hegel and we're going to unify philosophy into its true genuine notion. We're going to have to go in the world and teach it in this way and start embodying it in a living wisdom where we can address problems of freedom, which Hegel says is the absolute point of the philosophical system itself is that the liberation of spirit into genuine freedom is the purpose of life. And philosophers are the ones that are supposed to deliver that to those who are trapped and the abstract thinking and pictorial thinking of ordinary consciousness. So I think that is the, the, the solution to all, a lot of our problems today. And I hope that you are inspired to join me in at least reading Hegel directly and uh, taking up some of these golden nuggets for yourself uh, to help usher in a new world spirit. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to your questions. Okay, uh, Thanks, Mark. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions right now or comments? Well, um, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, well, I have, I have seen some questions if nobody else has any right this minute. Um, um, yeah, uh, my, my first question is 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 really basic. Um, um, it, it, it seems as though as though Hegel is a uh, is offering a therapeutic or a, a kind of a, a solution to a problem. Uh, but what exactly is that problem, and um, do you really think that everyone experiences that problem? 
uh, Mark, you, and what exactly, I mean, you, I mean, you said a lot and I can probably get some of this, but I wanna know what, could you summarize that? What exactly is it that you think is wrong that Hegel is, is offering a solution or can you put it in a sentence or two? For sure. Uh, and you know what? I have a different account where I can log in. Uh, I don't know if you see me in the waiting room there, but I'm on my phone. If you want to see my face, I think we can let in my second account. Um, uh, got it. Okay. I don't know. Oh, oh, no. I don't think it's going to let me do it. Um, okay. Well, I see you now. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. So summarizing the issue of Hegel. Am I echoing on your guys' side? I, I, can, I can hear you. And... OK, I'm not sure if I'm echoing. I'm, I'm echoing on my side. Um, but technically, Hegel's solving one problem and one problem only. And that's the problem of genuine freedom. All that we're doing and all of our life endeavors is just realizing who we are. Uh, could, and that's could, you, your, could you explain what genuine freedom is? Um, yeah, so Hegel's concept of freedom is defined in a science of logic. After he transcends Spinoza and his substance. So Hegel is uh, famous for understanding that Spinoza did not grasp the subjective moment of substance and that he came and made Spinoza's substance think. And that's what the notion is. And the notion liberates itself from substance in a clever way, which defines what real freedom is. What we consider freedom normally is not real freedom. It's what he calls abstract freedom. And abstract freedom is in opposition to necessity and determinism. Uh, but as long as they're in opposition, they're conditioning each other into a bad infinite. It's not a genuine infinite. So in a way, it's this contradiction where you're not truly experiencing the sublation of those two or freedom from those two. Because abstract freedom is caprice. You can negate anything you want, do anything you want. When you think, you're by default always performing the first negation. You're not necessarily performing the sublation, which is the negation of negation. If you want genuine freedom, he says you have to break out of that conditionality and become free of abstract freedom and necessity itself. And when you do that, you sublate those two as essential moments in the genuine freedom that spirit is trying to become and realize for itself. And he gives a, a name to that. And that name is destiny. So genuine freedom is actually a combination of caprice, the abstract freedom, aligned with necessity and determinism. So that's why when you're developing yourself or you're growing in consciousness in sensuous reality, as spirit implicit at first, you are creating yourself in a real sense, but you're also discovering yourself. And those are the two moments of that logical a dialectical stage when they align when they're congruent with each other that's when you know in yourself that you're rising to your highest potential of what is implicitly in you and you actualize that as self-actuality and so that's what genuine freedom is supposed to be is this not not this abstract negation of a state or any laws whatsoever or even the universe itself you're supposed to harmonize with it and also find where you're supposed to change it into a higher level of reason. And when you do that, that's when you become an agent of not just the spirit in yourself, but the universal that you embody as part of your destiny, uh, you usher into the world as a new world spirit. You become an agent of world spirit as your destiny and as the destiny of the world. And so that's why religious people like Hegel, because they say, oh, perfect, see, that's providence. That's God's will. And you're just aligning to it. In some sense, that's true. but in an existential sense, in terms of an atheistic sense, you're on both ends of that process. So you're really just aligning with your own self. So you are in some way uh, God-like or God itself once you realize your absolute potential. And I think this is what Hegel calls the cunning of reason 
where in your absolute potential, when everything is realized and known to yourself, when you are in and for yourself, uh, to get out of that all-knowing stage at the end of absolute cognition, you have to basically trick yourself into not knowing you're all-knowing. And that starts the process of experience all over again or finite experience all over again. Otherwise, you remain in indeterminacy, except from the opposite side of Descartes, which is that instead of the negative beginning of absolute nothingness, which turns into pure being, you enter it from the other side of the encyclopedia, which is the absolute brightness, the absolute positive, which is also indeterminate because it's like everything is illuminated to the point that it's all just you and you can't distinguish anything else from you. So it's also indeterminate and it starts pure being back up and you can choose another experience in a particular form. So I think that this problem of genuine freedom is what we're all striving for and what we've always stro strove for in every generation to the technically the beginning of time itself. And I think what we're doing now is entering into a system of culture that is not keeping pace with our material power. And we're using that material power to restrict a sense of, of destiny for billions and billions of people which is undermining the human spirit. And so I think if we're not careful, we're not going to achieve uh, this higher level of freedom, this, this genuine freedom, unless we have this kind of concrete thinking of what Hegel says is a genuine philosophy where every single person is deserving of genuine freedom just because they are the notion, they are spirit implicit for no other reason and that's why he thought Jesus was a, a great philosopher, because he was the first one that came in and brought that principle into actuality, not just theoretically, but practically. And he died for that. Whereas Aristotle, uh, Socrates, Plato, we like to think of them as these great thinkers, obviously. But we forget that in Athenian society, only the Athenians were allowed to do philosophy. And they still had slaves running the rest of the economy. Same with Rome. Uh, so we're still trying to actualize this principle universally for everyone 2,000 years later uh, because Jesus was just the principle, but genuine philosophy is supposed to complete that uh, and complete Jesus' super sensuous message, um, which has been edified into a sensuous interpretation, which is why even Christianity isn't sublating into genuine philosophy. So that's why I think we're, we still have some work to do, but that's the central problem that no matter who you study, no matter what discipline you're in, no matter what stage of life, you, we're all aiming for this cognition of genuine freedom, which in, in modern terms, we could call flow state, where you have this sense of timelessness, you have the sense that you're completely immersed in your life and what you're doing, uh, and that it's intrinsically enjoyable. You don't need anything outside of yourself to want to pursue this self-actualization. So I hope that's a good explanation, um, but I do think it makes a lot of sense in terms of how climate change, um, our political systems, the anxiety and depression that's going on, uh, all of these problems are really just risking this ability to actualize our genuine freedom, our destiny. Yeah, um, yeah, Mark, the, um, I guess uh, I, two, two, two points, one, one is, in the, in the histories and the philosophers you covered, I noticed you was conspicuously missing were the empiricists, the existentialists, and the phenomenologists. And I gather that they would be um, seen as the more sensualist, anti-Hegelian of the bunch. Of, of why is that? Why they're missing, um, or what? There's that. Do you have any response to that? I mean, I'm thinking of yeah. people like Locke, Hume, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, maybe to some extent Schopenhauer, Husserl, and some of the other uh, phenomenologists. Uh, what they all have is that they, they try to avoid the abstract, the, the, uh, the, the, the world, that, the Hegelian world, and many were quite critical of it. And what, what, what is your response to them, or do you have? I think they were just. Uh, so I. <laughs> Uh, I'm still learning this myself, right? Like it's immense. And so I, I haven't had time to go through all the other philosophers yet. So for me, like I was studying philosophy for about 20 years 
before I started taking Hegel seriously. And uh, the first time I went over them, like all the philosophers that I just put on the screen now, I did not understand this well uh, beforehand, but I was familiar with all their philosophies, right? But they're full of contradictions. And the same goes for Nietzsche, uh, Kierkegaard, all of them. But what's exciting now is in returning to them, you don't abstractly negate them anymore. Like there's no impulse within to say, my philosopher is the best, get rid of your philosopher entirely. The great thing about Hegel, and the reason why I think we should follow him, not just in terms of his system, but also in method and the way he did philosophy, was that he finds the truth in somebody and makes them ideal in the right order to things. Yeah, he integrates people. He doesn't just cancel people. And as we know, in our current culture, we have something called cancel culture, which is incredibly painful uh, and doesn't seem to progress anywhere. So I think for me, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to come back to philosophy because it's like a whole new world. And I have a funny feeling when I reread um, Nietzsche and all these philosophers, it's going to clarify why they're so great, but also clarify where their limits are and then put them in this encyclopedia somewhere where they might have deepened a particular aspect of the philosophy, but not the whole system. So one thing that I'm pretty confident of already is that even though philosophers may have deepened a particular area of the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences of Hegel, no one has sublated the entire system. Um, Husserl, I think, tried creating its own system. Marx didn't try. Marx was just trying to flip Hegel on his head and then did you know, most of his deepening in terms of political economy. Um, there's a couple of modern geniuses that are doing it through uh, physics, like Chris Langan. But in terms of one universal logic, I don't think anybody's done it. And I don't think anybody's even gotten close because the, the science of logic is just, it's mind blowing. So one of the philosophers that I did have a chance to get into, and I did make a presentation on Kierkegaard. Um, and I did give a presentation on some of the tenets of Nietzsche's Ubermensch, where basically, you know, I think Kierkegaard has the night of faith, which is the Ubermensch of uh, Nietzsche, except more religious. Um, they're all talking about absolute spirit. And same with Heidegger. So Heidegger's notion of being makes a lot more sense to me now. And I think it's because with the, the bit of deep diving that I've done so far, he's conflating all the different forms of being into Dasein. And he's saying that you have to begin with the phenomenological element because that's the only, it's like Descartes. But I don't think that's true. I don't think he's, he's grasping the absolute negation that you have to do to get to pure being. And what uh, Heidegger is calling general being as belonging to Dasein is really just pure being. So just there, it sounds like if Dasein is temporal, it has to exist in sensuous time space, then in terms of the screen here, he's, he's in this world. He's saying Dasein happens somewhere in here, right? But being in general happens over here, at least for Hegel. And when I was discovering more about, you know, what was the real problem of being for Heidegger, he says, one of the central problems is that how do you get from a being, being in general, to multiple beings and different beings and still have one being? That problem, I realized, is solved by Hegel in the science of logic, because pure being isn't just its own dialectical stage. So pure being in its first moment is itself purely formally. But then by just being itself, just by ising itself, it of course negates itself immediately into pure nothing. And then pure nothing and pure being aren't really separate from each other. Hegel calls it a distinction that is no distinction. And that's a true speculative movement because they are the same exactly, but different. The being of pure nothing is the, being of pure being. It's just the pure empty intuiting of pure thought itself. 
but there's not a finite mind there to have intuition. This is like the pure thinking of pure thought itself. So don't get that confused. But this sameness and difference continues through every other category of thought, which means that all other stages are a form of pure being. And that's what universality is. So all the other forms are forms of pure being, which gives it the universality where it can be being in general, but it can also be the same being as all the other different beings. He's just carrying the same speculative moment through the determinations. And that's why everything else is really a being and a thinking. It is a being and an empty intuiting at first that develops itself into its sublation into another being. We think that being has to be being in the world, but it doesn't. That's the mistake that Heidegger is making. That's the abstract abstraction he can't sublate, which is why he's conflating pure being and its universality with the, the apparent universality of the being of Dasein, which I think Hegel would call, uh, it's the being that happens in the philosophy of spirit between what Hegel calls uh, natural soul, dreaming soul, and actual soul, and then consciousness itself. And how I made this connection was there's a moment that comes once the being of Dasein develops itself, it has an ultimate form of being that he calls um, the moment of vision, I think. And the moment of vision is where Dasein sees itself clearly as what it really is. And that moment sounds exactly the same as the being that Hegel calls absolute spirit. And so that's why I think Heidegger because he doesn't grasp the whole systematic order, is conflating at least at minimum, pure being, uh, the being of consciousness and absolute spirit in one concept that he's calling Dasein, that he's trying to universalize into all the other beings. But I think he, he grasps the speculative moment of sameness, which is true, but he's missing the moment of difference which is the distinctions in their logical order. And so when I went to these Heidegger scholars who, who were challenging me, um, I said, first of all, I said, first of all, does he have his own system? If a philosopher doesn't have a system that completes itself and self grounds itself, they automatically have at least one question that is axiomatic and unjustified, which makes it faith bound, which makes it more in the religious mode of consciousness or at best abstract philosophy, it can't be genuine philosophy. And when I looked into Heidegger, he doesn't have a completed system. I even went to Whitehead and Whitehead also doesn't seem to have a completed system, but he knew he was supposed to have a completed system, just like Schelling was supposed to have a completed system, but he didn't do it because to do it, you have to grasp the determinate difference. So that's a long winded answer. Okay. But okay. Well, just... I, I have some more questions, but I'm going to let Sam uh, ask his before I go on. Go ahead, Sam. Are you there? Yeah, hi. Uh, I think one of the reasons why Heidegger can come across as such a earth shattering, uh, you know, basically have such an impact on modern minds is uh, that there are certain ways of investigation that have basically fallen by the wayside. And uh, uh, for example, uh, mysticism and uh, uh, what is called hermetic thought and uh, people like Jakob Boma and others, Kusa, many others. Uh, uh, and a lot of this stuff is literally not even known outside of Germany. I'm not talking about like people who, who are very fluent in German, but yeah, it's almost like part of German culture. So you have to spend at least double digit number of years if to even begin to grasp that stuff somewhat like, you know, if you're trying to understand Tibetan Buddhism. So there's that. The other thing is, yeah, he's a master of uh, rhetoric. And again, that's something which is also not taught. And, uh, you know, I mean, the words that he uses and, uh, you know, I mean, throughout this talk, you know, the word uh, for science that was so liberally used, uh, uh, the term he uses is Wissenschaft. And that is something which is, uh, you know, very different from our modern conception of science, even though at one time in English, <laughs> you know, uh, theology was considered the queen of the sciences. So anyways, uh, basically, yeah, you have to be very careful when you deal with, uh, you know, 
somebody coming from a different era. And obviously, you know, Kierkegaard uh, was mentioned. Yeah, so he came up with the, you know, uh, very interesting and worthwhile objections. Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, you know, they recognize the, you know, the shell of, uh, you know, that uh, religious uh, style of thinking uh, within Hegel. Science, you know, I mean, uh, it's, you know, kind of a funny thing, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe he, you know, I mean, prefigured, uh, you know, modern science in the same way that, uh, you know, Democritus or Epicurus or whoever it was who first came up with the idea of the atom. I mean, you know, there's a vast chasm between some, you know, extremely, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't want to use some harsh word, but like a very primitive, uh, you know, concept and how it actually, we find out how it actually can be, you know, as it were, grasped. And finally, for me, by far the most useful uh, is Adorno in terms of, yeah, basically the dangers of allowing this type of extremely loosey-goosey talk in which, you know, uh, words are thrown about with abandon of contradictions and this and that. I mean, you can do anything you want, you know. I mean, it's it's just like a, you know, child's, uh, you know, mechano uh, set, and you know, you can show what this thing is, that thing's opposite, and and there are always, you know, the infinite number of gradations between them. So. Uh, you know, uh, 20th century was wasted uh, in uh, uh, basically all kinds of, you know, ideological follies, uh, partly inspired by a man who spent three years in the Zurich library reading Hegel, <laughs> a very hardcore way. And yeah, uh, you know, we don't have thousands of years left to, you know, work out all the different ways in which uh, these ideas can be messed up uh, or lead to bad, uh, you know, outcomes. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, think uh, that Hegel was not a bad person. He had uh, good aims and uh, uh, there are other ways of uh, reading him. Uh, one which I find much, uh, uh, you know, worthwhile is Benedetto Croce's uh, recommended method, which uh, he came up with in his essay called What is Living and What is Dead in Hegel, published on the 100th anniversary of um, publication of the phenomenology in 1906, and that's available online. And uh, what he recommends is, yeah, basically, you know, you can read him in a poetic way. And yeah, I mean, these are all, you know, very worthwhile things to be uh, working towards freedom. But yeah, if you had all tried to apply his methods, uh, uh, you know, uh, 99 times out of 100, and that's a very conservative number, you will end up in <laughs> up a creek uh, named with a four letter word. Thanks. Okay, uh, Mark, do you, do you want to respond? And then I may have some other questions, but go ahead, Mark, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I think I think that's a pretty lucid comment. And two things is like Adorno and the mysticism, uh, like the wild abandon with words, like, yeah, we can't use words sloppily. And that's what Hugh Hegel is accused of. It's like, he's using words in a contradictory way. He's throwing them all about. It's not making any sense, but actually he's using the words in a very specific order. And if you don't know the order of the words, like the, what I realized is that the order is every, like everything. Um, and he gives you that order in the science of logic. So he's building other words from only the previous words, but he's doing something sneaky too, is that he's, he's also using all the other words in the system because they ground each other. But he's using this word implicit and explicit, kind of like David Bohm, was talking about if anybody knows David Bohm, it's kind of like he applied it to the universe, but all the thoughts are always present in some way, either implicitly or explicitly. And when you're going to the science of logic, he's saying that you can only really use the explicit words before the previous words to define the next words. And he says, this process of moving from one word to another word to another word, another stage from another stage to another stage, that is the definition of that word. And not only is it the definition, but it is the proof of that definition and the proof of any concept ever. So the later concepts in his encyclopedia or in his logic, at least, uh, in order to define them, you have to know all the movements of all the prior stages just to know it's, it's true definition. But you can say, the essence of a definition at the topmost level from the triad that is the actual sublation of that immediacy, that being, that word. And so you can summarize it in terms of these triads, which people say was not a Hegelian thing. But one of the things I wanted to clarify, which I didn't have time in this presentation, 
I do have a slide, it's right here, um, is that the triad is a real thing in Hegel. It's just that the way you do it matters. If you do it in the dead way without sublation, that's the mistake that, they, that, that Kant made. And I was really gonna talk about that. In fact, I missed it. That's, wh that's what I was gonna do is with Kant, I was gonna show that he missed this. But anyway, Hegel does use the triad. Here's an example from the encyclopedia where he's missing the third piece and people cite often, oh, see this part in Hegel's encyclopedia where there's not three everywhere. But then of course, this was like his 1817 version, but then in 1830, we see that he does include the third one. He might've just not known it or how to communicate it at that time. And that's all we're ever doing. So as modern science progresses, we're really just filling up the encyclopedia wherever there's not a triad. Um, so when you're defining your words, uh, you have to be extremely precise. And then Hegel is, people just aren't precise enough to realize how precise uh, he really is. We have to restructure modern dictionaries according to the science of logic to make sense of our words and not just abstractly define them willy nilly by referencing other words and not having those words defined. So every definition of every word at its root category all boils down to pure being, every single one of them. That's why it's universal, right? Um, in terms of mysticism, um, what I discovered is that Hegel says this himself, and I really wish I would have put the quote in here because if this talk gets sent around, um, people are gonna think I made that up. But if you look in Hegel's Lesser Logic in paragraph 82 or 86, in fact, I have it right here, actually. Um, if you look up mysticism, uh, he uses it in paragraph, where am I at here? In paragraph 82, he directly says himself, speculative truth, it may also be noted, means very much the same as what, in special connection with religious experience and doctrines, used to be called mysticism. But then he goes on to explain that what he means by mysticism is scientific mysticism not superstition. Superstition was the problem that plagued religion in the past, but that doesn't mean religion didn't have truth to it. It did have pure thoughts in it, but it couldn't separate the two. And that's why it couldn't achieve the sublation to genuine philosophy. So real genuine philosophy is supposed to be mysticism. It's supposed to be mystical. And what makes it mystical is the speculative nature of holding contradictory thoughts in concrete unities in the right order um, is what makes it amazing and uh, is what the mystery was supposed to be to the uh, hermetics and the occultists of the past, but Hegel reveals it for us. I think that hopefully covers a little bit of what you said that modern philosophy is not a complete waste of time at all. It just didn't grasp these really difficult notions because they're hard to sublate beyond abstract thinking. Um, and I want to mention one more thing really quickly, which was, uh, in terms of the other philosophers that I read in my past, but I have not gone over with my new understanding, um, I still have my abstract understanding of some of their philosophies. So when I was reading Hegel, I still can remember, like sometimes I re read a part of Hegel and I remember something else some other philosophy would, philosopher would say. And I would, I would realize, oh, that's what they meant or, oh, they were missing that. So I know enough about the other philosophers to know that none of them did what Hegel has done. Uh, some parts they have like repeated, but it's only parts. Um, but as we go through, I, I really believe in this so strongly that uh, there's a document I created uh, and I'm really inviting all the other philosophers who are true philosophers or at least passionate philosophers. I shouldn't say true because we're all technically true philosophers. Uh, but there's a, a document I call the synchronicity document of philosophies. Um, Hmm, how do I do this? I'm gonna try and open it for you guys, but it's basically a document that summarizes all philosophers in history and it puts them in Hegel's order and it shows where their categories align with Hegel and where their limits were. And so as I, as I or other people who are inspired and can see the truth in what I'm saying, uh, as they feel inspired to put their favorite philosophers in this perspective, um, they can contribute to this document and put their philosopher in a column and start ordering based on the order of the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences. And so here's the document right now. And you can see that on the far left side, we begin with the most ancient philosopher philosophies, which is kind of where Hegel began, right? So, you know, 2,500 years ago, we had uh, Egyptian religion and Egyptian philosophy. 
Then we had the Mayans, Hindus, Judaism, Buddhism, Taoism becoming more recent. Then we have, of course, Greek philosophy with Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Um, and as we go over, we're just getting more and more recent until we get to Hegel. And in Hegel's column, uh, there's Kant. Um, we have his column in red because horizontally we see time pass, but vertically we have conceptual order pass. So here's his entire set. Well, the largest categories of science and logic listed per row. And then of course uh, it ends up uh, going to nature. So I didn't put very much emphasis on nature yet. I filled this all out. I just ran out of time. And then of course we have the third part of the encyclopedia, which is the philosophy of spirit. And there's a couple of his main categories here. But if you see, um, we're just aligning all the other philosophers and their symbology with these categories. So the shelling, uh, in terms of the topmost, Hegel calls his metaphysics the science of logic. Robert Owen doesn't have a metaphysics. Um, Schelling was calling his a positive system, and that's what was missing in Hegel, was that he was too negative, he didn't have the positive. But the reality of that is that Hegel is positive and negative. Um, George Boole didn't, or Charles Darwin didn't have a metaphysics. Anyway, Kierkegaard did. He had existence and existentialism. I do give a talk on that in my sessions of spirit. But this is where it starts to get profound, is when you get to logicians, I already started translating all their logics into Hegel's logic. So here's the science of logic in Boolean notation, at least to the current level that I understand it. Here's Peirce's notation. Here's Frege's concept script, because here's Frege's column. Uh, I did do a little bit of Nietzsche. Nietzsche had an ontology. His ontology was pure becoming. So he grasped the Her Heraclitus moment, but doesn't seem to have grasped Zeno's moment in Parmenides as uh, belonging to each other as the determinate ness of pure becoming there's Freud there's a whole bunch here now right um but here's Heidegger's column because the guy who attended my sessions really challenged me and so he filled out his version uh this is what he thinks Heidegger was saying in terms of the order and I don't know if this is 100 true because I haven't gone through it all but here's what I do know so far is that I don't think existence starts with pure being I don't think that's what Heidegger meant because temporality doesn't exist in this realm. So really it's the ontology of being, but Heidegger didn't grasp that. So, you know, being in general, all this kind of stuff. Anyway, okay, uh, all the other philosophers I'm hoping to put in here and hopefully if you're inspired to help, uh, it's wide open. Okay, okay, sorry, that was a long answer. No, it's all right, Mark. it's all right. Mark. I, I, I'm still trying to understand the basics here. So I, I have some, you know, the, my questions are skeptical and it's, um, First of all, um, it seems to be an article of tremendous faith that Hegel is asking us to believe that there is any kind of system to be had. And even if there is, that we are, have access to it. Um, and uh, because he, his, 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 uh, his a synthetic way of going about absorbing and integrating whatever any other philosopher says seems to prevent the possibility of there being an anti-Hegelian out there, someone who, who flatly says, look, Hegel, you're completely wrong, not partially wrong, the way you think that other philosophers are, other philosophers are but completely wrong. Is, is there any philosopher out there that Hegel would say, well, that, that philosopher is not partially wrong, but completely wrong? Can you, can you say, speak to that for a moment? I'm just trying to place Hegel a little bit. If, uh... If a philosopher is completely wrong, they're not really doing philosophy. Well, that's what they have to deal with. It's since they reject them as philosophers to say that they're, if they're completely wrong, they're not doing philosophy. But but I guess that I guess that's an answer. But you know, it does seem um, it does seem a little I don't know uh, worrisome that that no matter what a philosopher says, they're either not a philosopher or they're they are partially right, and Hegel's absorbed them. It's like he doesn't uh, allow for the possibility of, of, of a philosopher who's opposed to him. I, I, if they're opposed to him it, completely, they aren't philosophers. Um, so anyway, I, I, the, the very idea that, that there is a, even a system uh, a, of an, at all in, and, in things like scientific mysticism, I, I, I appreciate science and I actually do appreciate mysticism, but I don't think they, they fit well together. I think uh, the trying to integrate them is to is in danger of muddling 
uh, things. And that's just the way I see things. And that's why I find it very difficult to, um, to really uh, appreciate Hegel. I mean, um, I guess the, 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 he's a great synthesizer. He's, he's an integrator and somebody sh probably should be taking that perspective. And the way that some other philosophers have, like in, in a smaller, less ambitious way, like, like uh, Kant, for example, who tried to synthesize the rationalist and the empiricist, um, or there are others. So, I mean, but what Hegel tries to do, or seems to try to do, is to do it all. And I, I just find it um, ungraspable. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it just borders on very much like a, a religious faith that you have to accept there even is a system and that we have access to it. Um, I mean, why, I mean, if a philosopher said, no, there is no system, there's just one damn thing after another, period. You, you can impose a system, we can create systems that are useful, that may serve some human purpose, but they're cre creations and some other person or group might create a different system. But there is no overarching single system that's gonna integrate it holistically as a whole. I mean, I mean, I guess if someone said that, as I am saying it right now, that would, would be, I would, he would say, I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> I, I guess that's what, you're, what he would say, right? No, actually you're, you're missing what I said. So I didn't say that if you challenge Hegel, you're not a philosopher at all. Um, if you have no universals in your philosophy, you don't have philosophy, you have opinion. But most people are philosophers. Uh, they're just not genuine philosophers. So that means they're abstract philosophers. So what that means is that they can still have universals in their philosophy and it doesn't have to be a system and they're still a philosopher. They're just not a genuine philosopher because you, you need to justify all your propositions. And if you don't have a system, it's very simple logic. If you don't have a system, then um, you don't have a coherence. And that means that some of your principles have to be taken on faith. You don't justify them. But real science has to justify every piece in the system. Where did it come from? You can't just make it up in thin air, you know? Um, so he, he says that if you have a piece outside the system, then how do you justify that piece? So that means every piece has to be inside the system or else it's unjustified. So that's why he says you have to have a system or else you end up with this, this kind of spiraling process where it is one damn thing after the other. Uh, and that's happening in terms of nature too, um, but they're not connected. And he says, no, real genuine rationality is always connected and self grounds itself. Uh, and I think that if you don't have that, he says you end up in a realm, like you can have that, uh, you just won't be able to communicate it. And it leads to a less coherent and less rational world, which is not useful anyway. So even if you were right and you can have that, it's not helpful in any way. So he says the only real helpful philosophy is a rational one that is systematic. Otherwise, you're not justifying all your terms. You're making an assumption somewhere, which is faith. And that's why he says well, that. Uh, well, a rational, coherent philosophy um, that I don't, I don't think it's necessary to have one to function at least as well as those who do have such a rational uh, view. I don't, I mean, I took a look at animals. I don't think they do any abstract philosophizing, but they have been around a lot longer than us. And if, uh, I mean, like, um, what, what is the, uh, th there's a very, at least one philosopher I know has accused Hegel of being uh, see, phenomenally optimistic about things. And where does that optimism come from? Is it, is it imposed upon the world? Is it that we must be where it's built into our nature that we're fundamentally optimistic and we have to, there is coherence out there to be, to be found, to be, to be, un, to be revealed by our, our reason, our minds. Uh, that optimism is just like, it comes out of nowhere, as far as I can tell, you know, I can understand why, why uh, many r religious views would, would take that view, because they, they actually are optimistic, they believe there is something out there that explains all of this, and Hegel seems to have a system like that, um, but it's not obvious to me that there has to be any system, it's, it seems like a very optional philosophy, but it's not clear where it's, it's groundedness and, and phenomenology or the way the world, humans experience the world. Unless you're saying that we can't experience the world any other way except this.
but that sounds very fundamentally religious to me. Anyway, go ahead. If you want to respond. Sure. Um, there's a few clarifications that will help here. It's that if you don't have system, you have chaos. And the people that, you know, the, the philosophers that say, well, you don't have to have one mega system. They're taking for granted that the little bits of fragments that they can communicate are little systems of thought that are coherent in themselves. Because if it wasn't a system of thought that was coherent in itself, it would be pure randomness. And that's kind of where Hegel separates the science of logic, the realm of Plato's forms, and uh, the beginning of space and time and sensuousness, the philosophy of nature. Um, he says that the divine idea, the absolute idea, which religion calls God, uh, secularists or atheists would probably just call it science that completes itself, the theory of everything, thinking its own self, uh, unbiasedly, perfect reason. It lets itself go free. It negates itself into what it is not. So if the absolute idea is perfect reason, that means it doesn't have to tarry with imperfect forms. It doesn't have to tarry and figure itself out in time or space. The science of logic is a timeless, spaceless realm. It just instantly and immediately thinks itself into all of its forms. Uh, and we're repeating that, except in a sort of, we have to tarry with like contingency, which is the irrationality of nature. So when the absolute idea others itself or lets go of itself into nature, it turns into what it's not, which is pure irrationality, chaos, lack of system. So the being of nature as the otherness of perfect reason is the canvas of caprice, is the canvas of pure contingency that allows us to have real free will to break free of perfect reason. But perfect reason comes through that canvas of irrationality, that chaos. It's the absurdist moment of the existentialist, right? That's why the existentialist is right. They recognize a crucial, a crucial moment, a true moment in the system. As pure reason comes through contingency, it has to work its way through and systematize itself. And it doesn't start with human beings or animals. It starts with time itself. It starts with space itself. Space negates itself into time. And then time turns into matter and light. And it just keeps sublating itself as a, repeat, a repeating of the perfect logic but it takes time for it to work itself into the higher sublations, which we call evolution. And then eventually when you get to um, the animal, the animal is reason, but it's not explicit reason. It's not reason for itself. It's only reason in itself. So that means the reason spirit is, Im is implicit in animals. So any structure in nature whatsoever, if, it's, if it has any kind of coherence, or understandableness to it, that's not just self-destruction and complete randomness. That is what reason is. And it's just developing itself into more and more complex systems. So an animal has a body that can move and it has a systematic order, it has a system to it, where it's not just giving into complete contingency and irrationality. It's just that in its own mind, it hasn't explicated that level high enough to realize it for itself in its own pure thought thinking. It sublates itself through habit into consciousness. But consciousness is not spirit as spirit yet. Hegel calls consciousness abstract spirit. So it's not explicit reason yet. It's just the realization of the pure eye in sensuous form with an object. So it's the eye reflecting on itself, but it's not aware yet that its own reflection is reason. So it can have irrational reflections in itself, which is where psychosis and a bunch of stuff can happen. But when you start developing your reason towards higher levels of self-consciousness through the master-slave dialectic and all this kind of stuff, eventually you, you achieve reason as reason. That means thinking reason is itself reasonable. And that's what the philosopher is supposed to be. That's where genuine philosophy starts to begin. And that's what spirit is. Spirit as spirit starts with that kind of thinking. And then it sort of develops itself into, you know, objective spirit in our institutions. And you get the synthesis between the individual and the universal and eventually it turns into universal spirit. But um, I would say to answer your question, this is the real dynamic between uh, system and anti-system, philosophy and anti-philosophy. Anybody that tries to negate system has to address this question of why is there something understandable than just complete chaotic randomness? And what they, the answer is, well, I don't have to have a complete system. The whole world operates in fragments. But then you have to explain why some fragments connect to other fragments and other fragments don't. And you have to justify, well, if it's not the system, 
that makes it understandable. How is understanding possible? You have all these other questions that make less sense when you don't come at it from a systematic totality. And I think those are the questions that uh, those kinds of philosophers have to answer. And uh, it doesn't mean their system is wrong. It just means it's, it's abstract, it's a fragment. And Hegel took all those fragments because at the end of a fragment, at the end of like, the limit of your philosophy is the limit of your reason. The limit of your friendship is the limit of your reason. The limit of your love is the limit of your reason. At the limit of the reason is always a contradiction that is un unsublated or taken for granted or implicit. So then it, it doesn't make sense with its opposite somewhere. So once you find the opposite, you'll, you'll grasp this contradictory paradoxical nature of the world and it won't make sense to you until you sublate it. And so Hegel's just saying that if you can do it for a little fragment, why not do it for all the fragments? And that's exactly what he did. And I think it makes more sense that way because it can answer those difficult questions. And it can even answer the question of where does reason come from? Well, it comes from itself, thinking itself eternally, but also beginning itself as this formal process of distinction that we're a part of. And um, it, it might not be perfect, but it, it just makes a lot more sense than all the abstract philosophers that I, I or anybody else read it. He answers those questions that they couldn't answer. So until somebody can do a better job, um, we we're stuck with them. But I guess here's one last thing I want to say, because you, you hit on a good point. Um, most people who teach philosopher, uh, teach Hegel, also make another mistake. And this is going to be another golden nugget as I start teaching the science of logic. But there are some YouTube Hegelians uh, and some scholarly Hegelians that say that Hegel is the end of philosophy, is the end of history, is the end of a bunch of stuff. Uh, but that's not 100% true. He is the end of philosophy to that point of development. He's the summit. But he tells us in the history of philosophy that he will be sublated one day. He's empowering us to sublate him, not abstractly negate him. So he's fully predicting that we will eventually sublate particular parts of the system, but also maybe even sublate the system itself. But we can't do that until we understand him because that's part of the dialectical moment that leads to sublation in the first place. So that's the true Hegel. He's a lot more humble, but he's also very confident. And I think that's a great point. And, who, and whoever sublates Hegel in the future, now or in the future, themselves will be sublated, right? And that there's no, no end game to it, right? As long as there's reason or consciousness at some point, right? Well, there is, there is an end point technically because we do achieve absolute knowing, um, but that takes a while. And uh, in, he in says a that- In a lifetime, uh, individuals in a lifetime can do that? Or you're talking about uh, the whole species, or do you mean an individual when you say achieving this? I think he means both because the gurus, Jesus, all these types of guys and, and figures and women, and they at some level did see the whole. And the problem was communicating it in sensuous reality. Um, but he does say that we do become absolute spirit, absolutely. And so this, this nature, nature never ends. So this is why people are right when they say one damn thing after the other. If nature ended, then um, you, end, you don't have a speculative moment where the eternal is always uh, at rest with itself. Because Hegel says the absolute is always at rest with itself. It's always complete. But he also says it's always moving too. And that movement is created by the irrationality of nature, constantly creating new forms, but in the form of reason. So the reason is always complete. That's the static part. But nature is this one damn thing after the other, which is a bad infinite that just keeps going forever, like, a, like a an irrational decimal point. And that's what allows us to experience ourselves as infinite. But you can realize that in sensuous, you can, you can have infinite consciousness in finite consciousness if you grasp the totality of the system and the pattern. And if you grasp the pattern, the coherence of it allows you to, uh, it allows you to kind of predict things that makes the progression timeless. And I think that's how you achieve it in that speculative way of being finite and infinite at the same time. And then the problem is just explicating it and bringing it into society and stuff like that, which takes time. But in yourself, you can achieve it. And maybe one day there will be a, a time where our species will achieve it collectively. I guess that is what absolute spirit is, um, but it will take time. And then after that, I guess it leads to indeterminacy um, where we just started all over again. That's my understanding so far. It's like a Star Trek kind of thing, perhaps. If we survive to that point, because Hegel says we might not make it. 
He says, in our version of the universe, there's two results to dialectic. One is negative, which is that the dialectic ends in contradiction and it cancels itself and stops progressing. But the other moment is that it, of course, overcomes the contradiction and it sublates into a higher immediacy. So that's what we're going for right now. And I think we can sense that, you know, there's a lot of weird things happening in the world that we need to take care of or else we might end up as the sixth mass extinction. But I think there's a lot of hope, especially if we take this pursuit of wisdom and carry it to its fruition and be critical of it and self-determine it for ourselves as real self-thinking agents, not take it blindly, but realize that there is some coherence and correspondence to this model of truth that nobody has ever discovered before and that is worth exploring. Okay, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, but is it, does anyone else have any uh, final questions or anything or comments? Um, if, if not, um, I, I guess, uh, yeah, thanks, Mark, for, for presenting Hegel to us. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm totally convinced, but, but I, think, I think I learned a few things. So hopefully I'll, I'll think more about it and we'll see. Uh, anybody else? Appreciate it, thanks. Okay. All right, then. Well, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, and uh, have a good, good time. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Stay free. All right. Bye.